story of four washed up actors. One unbalanced wonder weapon. And a shipload of error messages. The forgettable tale inspired by once legendary director George Romero. It's anchors away for brain damaging high round action. Eight years ago to this day, on May 3rd, 2011, Call of the Dead was released as part of the Escalation DLC for Black Ops 1. I remember that day distinctly. I actually took off from school so I could play the map from the get-go. I mean, map releases were awesome back then. Discovering aspects of the map for the first time with your friends. Trying to get a high round when the leaderboard entries were low. Man, there was nothing more than that. Call of the Dead was certainly considered a good map back then, and even to this day I imagine. It was more challenging than some of the previous maps, like Kino or Ascension, and stood out for a few other reasons as well. One being that it had a celebrity cast. Sarah Michelle Gellar, Robert England, Danny Trejo, and Michael Rooker. They seemed to be modeled after certain horror roles of theirs, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Freddy Krueger, Machete, and Merle Dixon. Back when everybody had an obsession with him, even though he had like... <laughs> five minutes of screen time on The Walking Dead. The other aspect of the map that stands out is the static boss zombie George A. Romero, of course considered the godfather of modern zombies, and also a pioneer of independent filmmaking in general. Now that we have established the superficial details of the map, let's jump into the nitty gritty. The biggest issue with including an enemy like George Romero in the map is that he limits camping, and thus, confines the variety of the gameplay. Back in late 2011, after all the Black Ops 1 maps released, it became increasingly popular for players to create challenges within each of those maps. You know, find new ways to play the game. This is where first room challenges started to take off, and also other challenges where you can't buy a specific wall weapon and establish rules that you and your friends would abide by. However, whenever you and your buddies were trying to think of a map to do a challenge on, Call of the Dead was usually out of the question since George Romero always ended up chasing you out of areas and prevented you from holding out a specific location. Then you need to go out of your way and take him to the water and shoot him with the VR-11, and it was just really a pain in the ass and took you out of the experience. I wonder if the developers ever acknowledged this fundamental design issue. And I suppose the idea was to keep the players always moving. Maybe Jimmy Zielinski had something to say about this back in the day. Gee, his... His hair is looking groovy in this Cold of Dead trailer. Yeah, let's hear what this guy has to say in the trailer. Whenever we think of uh, creating zombie maps, we always kind of think of what style of gameplay. Are people going to run? Are they going to hold? Pause it. Okay. So it seems like Jimmy might actually acknowledge that they're limiting camping on this map and encouraging players to be on the move. Mm, all right. Let's... Let's resume this trailer. And we always try to lean a little bit one way or the other without completely removing anybody's gameplay. And in this map, we are going to highlight sniping. Hold up. Wait a second, Jim. Who the hell is a sniper on Call of Duty Zombies? <laughs> uh, sometimes I really worry about you, Jimmy. In any case, I tweeted Jimmy a few years ago and asked him if George Romero actually provided voiceover for his character. Because my friend was trying to claim that George in the cutscenes didn't really sound like the actual George. Of course, Jimmy never replied. Real class act. Anyways, I think a lot of people just assume that Romero does the voiceover and whatnot. But I did some deep digging and found a couple of written interviews where Romero actually briefly mentioned Call of the Dead. In one interview with the Zombie Research Society, is that a thing? Okay. When asked if he did motion capture for his work on Call of the Dead, he stated, I didn't. I wish that I would have. They didn't use my voice. They wound up not using anything of me. Except my face. Poor bastard. I don't think that many people know this, so... Uh, let's submit this to the trivia on IMDB and get the word out. <laughs> Performed motion capture for uh, the opening cutscene. Boom! I'm holding down the fort. As alluded to earlier, one of the ways that you could temporarily get rid of George is by shooting his ass with the upgraded VR-11 while he's in the water. That'll make him go away for about a round. And if he's on land, you could shoot him with the upgraded VR-11 to make sure he's in his calm state, rather than being a triggered Stark Raven mad psychomaniacal lunatic. The VR-11 is a pretty fascinating wonder weapon, insofar as its functionality on co-op is radically different than solo. On co-op, you could shoot your teammate with the upgraded VR-11, and they'll have an acid trip and be granted brief invincibility and have insta-kill capabilities. Keep shooting your teammate with that gun, and the effects will stack up. On Solo, the VR-11 is pure garbage, making for some mind-numbing gameplay. I remember players back in the day trying to ricochet the VR-11 bullets off the walls in an effort to somehow shoot themselves with it and give themselves the insta-kill effect. Well, it didn't work out so well. One final note about the VR-11, if you upgrade the weapon, it becomes the VR-11 Lazarus. <laughs> Maybe someone should shoot Black Ops 4 with it and see if it resurrects the community. 
The go-to strategy on solo and co-op has nearly always been to chill by the AK-74U area, outside of the lighthouse. A lot of the map is actually rendered useless in the later rounds as a result, unless you're hitting a mystery box or something. In my last retrospective, I made mention of how Ascension was the first map to meet two conditions. One, a large player population, and two, largely legitimate leaderboards. Call of the Dead actually followed suit in this regard, which really propelled the growth of the high round scene, and brought about what I would call Generation 2 high round players. General strategies were becoming more well known, people had mastered Ascension to a large degree, and were now looking for new challenges. Players like Rumpy Doo Doo, Dynamite Bites Ya, Extra Crucial 420, and so forth started to slowly make a name for themselves. While Generation 1 players, the Cure for Zombies boys, Relaxin' and Christian, etc., were playing less and less as time marched on. But Relaxin' went on to make some classic Hold the Dead videos. I mean, he practically owes his career to George Romero. I <laughs> shit you not. Look how many videos this bastard made with either George in the thumbnail or in the video title. What the hell is this? White Vans Launcher? Uh, okay. As the title of the video suggests, Call of the Dead initiated a paradigm shift in the way that maps were designed and also approached by players. For the first time in Zombies, they tied the main easter egg quest into an actual console achievement slash trophy, and I don't want to hear any BS about the flytrap on Doris. It also provided incentive to players for completing the quest by rewarding them with a fan favorite Wunderwaff weapon. Also, for all subsequent games you played after completing the quest, every time you killed George, you would get the Wunderwaff instead of the death machine as well. The gradual emphasis on easter egg quests and story was perhaps essential, but I think it's extra crucial to make sure those elements don't come at the expense of the gameplay experience, and that might have happened in some maps along the way. So, finding that balance, while also incorporating the story seamlessly with the gameplay would be ideal. But the game as it was originally designed didn't take the future of the mode into consideration, so the gameplay and story never ended up fitting very well together, at least in my opinion. It's what people would call little narrative dissonance. With game criticism terms like that, I'm well on my way to becoming a hack journalist at Kotaku. There are quite a few people who only find value in participating in the initial easter egg hunt during the first few days of a map's release. Then, once it's solved and they complete the quest themselves, they move on to other games. The map is essentially done for them. The gameplay at this point is seemingly secondary to them, and I think that Call of the Dead helped promote this shift in the way that fans approach the game, and also helped dictate what developers look to include in future maps. Surely, there are many people who still want and view the gameplay to be primary, and on the other end of the spectrum, you'll have bastards like this guy on Reddit who says, Just get rid of the zombies altogether and make it a puzzle game! And while his sentiment is very radical, I think it further highlights the disconnect that exists now between gameplay and story. On the topic of easter eggs, there are some really great things that you can do with them. Just look at the easter egg in the Black Ops 4 map classified. Once the player hits round 150, a cutscene triggers. Obviously the steps, in this case, getting through the rounds, have no relationship to the cutscene or overarching story, but its purpose is to be a nod to dedicated high round players in the community. This gesture was obviously a great concept in theory, but its execution left a lot to be desired, as leaks spread about the existence of such an easter egg and then glitches were the first people to unlock the cutscene, which is sort of fitting since the fight of legitimate players versus cheaters has been a staple of the high rank community for over 10 years. Oh shit, here we go again. Both parties have the same goal, man's selfish need for recognition gained through the conquering of an opponent, with one side playing by the rules and the other taking shortcuts. There's always going to be that gray area as well. What exactly are the rules? And that's illustrated by another recent development regarding the classified easter egg, which is a tactic where players basically just have their shield out for over a dozen hours and get to round 150 without much, if any, difficulty. In my view, it's a fundamentally cheap tactic at best, and a wholly illegitimate exploit at worst. Others view it as completely fair. Mm, I think Mark Twain said it best back in the day. Suppose you were an idiot, and suppose you were a glitcher. But I repeat myself. Looking into the future for a moment, Call of the Dead is likely getting a remaster in 2020 for Black Ops 4 with a potential Zombies Chronicles 2 on the horizon. The lighthouse area is pretty much in blackout already, and it's the only Black Ops 1 Zombies map without a remake or remaster so far. I imagine the VR11 would be rebalanced a bit for Solo, kind of like the Winter's Howl against some minor improvements in Classified, but I wouldn't count on it. A remaster would probably feature the classic Ultimus crew that's trapped behind the door when you do the easter egg, as again the same celebrity actors again could prove challenging. I imagine George won't be on the map either, not that they need his voice, but secure and rights to use his likeness again and the whole situation with him passing away and him being a zombie on the map well it might not be very ideal what's the matter george not feeling so great 
But having a boss zombie like George follow you would have to be an essential aspect of a Call of the Dead remaster in my opinion, so I'm interested to see how they approach this design issue. It would be cool if they got a new cast of horror actors for the project. Here's my list of affordable horror icons. I want to see Jeffrey Combs, Ken Forey, Robert Crampton, and good old Bruce Campbell. They could de-age them all a bit, I'm sure. Oh, and John Carpenter is the boss zombie. <laughs> I'll end this video with some fun facts, trivia, and features about the map that I think are worth mentioning. <laughs> Hopefully I don't make any errors this time around. Alright, let's get through this quickly. First map where you could get a perk other than quick arrive without opening any doors, which is accomplished by killing George. Have fun shooting him with the M14 in Olympia. The song used in the trailer, Party Time, is a homage to the 1985 film The Return of the Living Dead, where that song was made popular. First map where there are multiple Pack-a-Punch Machine locations. First map with both an intro and outro cutscene. First map to introduce Semtex grenades. First appearance of Deadshot Daiquiri. First map to feature an Avenged Sevenfold song. Here's a poster of the band in the map. The scavenger explosion sound effect is reused for the subsurface resonator buildable and buried from Black Ops 2. When you shoot enemies with the upgrade of VR11, they turn into CIA dudes, who were eventually playable characters in the Black Ops 2 survival maps. Call of Dead was also included in the mobile game Call of Duty Black Ops Zombies. I've played it before. It's... not good. And finally, Call of Dead has the first playable female character. Not only for a zombies map, but for any Call of Duty mode. Also the opportunity to be the first female playable character. I mean, for me, breaking stereotypes is something that I love to do and to show that women can be empowered. Well, who can't resist the lovely Sarah Michelle, you know, running around with her midriff exposed. It's gonna be real fun just to pick her avatar only because she's so hot. I do it like this. <laughs> <laughs>